It's time to read the scripture. It's um, Exodus 20, 14. I'm not going to hurry. It's only five, wor- five words. So. <laughs> you shall not commit adultery. May the Lord add blessing to these words. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. So glad to see each of you here that I can see your face. For those that I can't see your face because you're on the other side of a computer screen, I'm glad that you've decided to worship with us as well. So thank you for being here. I'm just kind of curious. How many of you have your Bible with you? The Bible that you hold in your hands? Do you remember where you got it? Some of you have a digital And so you know exactly which app store you downloaded it from. (laughs) If you've got a a paper Bible, do you remember where you got this one? Who gave it to you? What store you bought it at, if you bought it yourself? This one that I hold, for example. This is one that Andrea gave to me before I preached my very first sermon. When I first came into the church, I I had a New Century version. It was a nice Bible. I I used it for all my studies. Uh, When it was getting close to time for my baptism, I went out and bought one of those big study Bibles. Anybody have a study Bible? All right. I bought one of those big study Bibles. And those are great Bibles with all the notes and all of the added comments and all of that. But when you become a preacher, to carry around one of those things, you get a bit of a workout. So before I preached my very first sermon, Andrea gave me this Bible. And so I've used it for every single sermon since I've preached my very first one. It means something special to me. The Bible that you have, is it special to you? Is the Word of God special to you? See, here's the thing. I've talked about it before. I've talked about Bible translations and different Bibles that are out there. And I've always said, the Bible translation that's best for you, having studied the Greek and the Hebrew, gone through a master's degree, taking classes on this stuff, the Bible translation that's best for you is the one where you hear the the voice of God speaking to you the best. I do have one little P.S. to add. There is one Bible translation that I wholeheartedly would invite you to not use as a part of your devotionals. There is... An ancient Bible produced in the 17th century, which has been nicknamed the Wicked Bible. This is back in the day before word processors and computers when they could simply uh, just hit print and produce a Bible. This is back in the day when you had to have typesetters who would individually add the letters or the words to the press and they'd press it down. It took a long time. It took a lot of skill. And this Bible right here, there's one of, there are 10 that are left in existence. You can pick one up for a small, that's about $100,000. And what makes this Bible special, why it gets called the Wicked Bible, is because as careful as the typesetters were, they made one mistake. They forgot three letters, one word. And, and the word is not... And the commandment where it was missing from was the seventh. And so if you can't do the math in your head, the commandment as it reads in the Bible of question, right there in verse 14, thou shalt commit adultery. Oops. The publishers actually were fined by the government for producing the Wicked Bible. Inadvertently, it was a mistake, but it was a mistake that could have been so costly because people sometimes try to live live as legalistically as possible, and this is one that I'm sure that there are some people who were excited to see. Look, it says right here, the Bible says. The fine was so steep that one of the publishers actually ended up in debtor's prison for a time. 
because it can be that important. So here I am today, if you couldn't figure it out, continuing our God's Big Ten series. As we look through the Ten Commandments, I get the seventh one. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I gave the seminary pastors an opportunity when I first told them that we're going to be doing a series. Pick your commandments, any commandment. I'm shocked and none of them jumped on this one. And admittedly, I can't wait until next week's sermon. It's about stealing. I can do stealing. Well, wait, that came out wrong. <laughs> because I am aware that as I look out in this congregation, there are many young families and many young voices and many young ears who are listening along. I have to somehow present God's law, a law that was so important to him that he wrote it with his own finger in this tablet of stone. I have to present this in a way that is family friendly. And so I will go out of my way to avoid certain words that will catch young ears. But at the same time, as tempting as it is to bypass the subject altogether, is it an important one? Is the world going to teach our kids about it? Oh, they're going to try. But I want to do what I can to make sure that they hear it from the church. And so I apologize in advance for the inevitable, very awkward for some of you, conversations that are going to happen at potluck or at your lunch today. There's no potluck today. Potluck at your house. I apologize in advance, but at the same time, I don't. Because this is a God-given gift. And the devil has taken this God-given gift and he has done some awful things with it. And so we're going to talk today about the fact that intimate relationships have been under attack since the beginning of sin. And so our take-home message, if you don't hear anything else or if you just want to block it out from here on out because you're not ready for this yet, here's the message. Our God is a God of wholehearted mutual commitment. Let's pray. Father God, as we prepare to open your word, we're going to take on a big subject, a sensitive subject. The fact that you made us as beings that have feelings and urges. You made us as beings that, that, that want to live up to your your great commandment of be fruitful and multiply. But at the same time, we know that what you have made good and very good, the enemy distorts, twists, corrupts. So Lord, may we be sensitive to the cares and concerns of this congregation. May we hear you speaking to us. Father, I pray that you would be the subject of all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we look at the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, I think we need to go back to the beginning. Back to the beginning when God created us. I mentioned it in my prayer. We were told originally in the book of Genesis, in creation, that we have one commandment, to be fruitful and multiply. That commandment comes up at the tail end of Genesis chapter 1. And at the end of that day, the, what day of creation was humanity created? The sixth day. At the end of the sixth day, God not only said that it was good, but he said that it was very good. It was good and very good that humanity had been created, male and female, in his image. And to this point, all the way through the story, everywhere we turn, it's good and very good. But as you keep reading the story, we run across a point where something not so good happens. And this is before there was a serpent and before there was a fruit. If you've got your Bibles, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, and you realize something interesting, that even in perfection, even before sin, or even while we were perfect, even before sin, humanity was made with a fundamental flaw. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, when you're there, say amen. If you need just another minute, say hallelujah. You're all there. Genesis 2, verse 18, and the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. 
I'll make a helper comparable to him. We are beings that are fundamentally made for relationships. That's how God made us. We desperately crave to have interactions with one another. And I can't help but notice that when he creates this helper, it's not another big, strong helper to help him work in the garden as he he made man to do. It's not another set of muscles. He makes a female, a counterpart, because male and female together become the image of God. How important is this helper? I've got a quote for you here. It says, man was not made to dwell in solitude. He was made to be a social being without companionship. The beautiful scenes and delightful employments of Eden would have failed to yield perfect happiness. Even communion with angels could not have satisfied his desire for sympathy and companionship. That is what God fundamentally put in us, a desire for relationships. God's ideal was lived out in that first couple, that humanity, that humans become one. Male and female, husband and wife. That was God's ideal, and yet I recognize that not all of you are married. Because at some point in my life, I wasn't either. You notice, when we say God's ideal, humans become one. It's not just husband and wife that becomes God's ideal. God has other ideals to satisfy this requirement for relationships. God has other options that are out there if he has chosen to not open it for people to become married. Obviously, the one that we know best would be Genesis 2.24, the two shall become one flesh, but that's not the only one. What about this one here? After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. He loved him as he loved himself. Is there something powerful in relationships of friendships? God's ideal is not division. It's coming together. It's working together. It's uniting together for companionship, for sympathy, for support. So we've got intimate relationships. We've got friendly relationships. Do you think God has set up a place for communal relationships as well? What was God's ideal for his people? That we would just sit aside in clusters of twos and threes, or twos? That we should sit aside in clusters as pairs of friends? No. When was the most powerful outpouring of God's Spirit in all of the New Testament era? It was the day of Pentecost. And what was the conditions? What was the church like when God had this powerful outpouring? Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord and in one one place. God's ideal is that humanity becomes one, united not only with each other, but also with him. That's God's ideal. That's the goal that we should be hoping for. So this sermon is not just for husband and wife or engaged or dating. This is for the people who want to have interactions. If you are human, this message is for you. Sound good? God's ideal that humans become one. So every time God has an ideal, what does the enemy want to do? He wants to distort it. He wants to destroy it. He wants to tear it up. And so I want you to catch this. If God's ideal is that the humans would cluster together, form relationships that lift each other up with companionship and sympathy, that help one another out through their difficult times, Satan's going to make a slight twist on that ideal. Check this out. Satan's ideal, that humans become alone. He likes to isolate us, to separate us. Male and female together represent the image of God. But what happens when he's able to get us alone? What happened to Eve when he was able to get her alone? What happens to each of us as that roaring lion who seeks to devour us is able to pluck us out from the herd? When we're alone, bad things happen. We see it happen, for example, I mentioned it back in the, in the uh, Genesis story. After God got Eve alone, I'm sorry, after Satan got Eve alone, 
and she sinned, and she got Adam to sin, what happened next? God appears. And in Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 11, we find this. God asked, who told you that you were naked? Because they were hiding and they were naked. Did you eat from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, you gave this woman to me. She gave me fruit from the tree, and so I ate it. And thus began division. The blame game, finger pointing. It's your fault that I did this. I would have been fine if you wouldn't have said anything. I would have been okay if it wasn't for your influence. I would have been fine by myself. But then you interacted. What is this saying? I want to be alone, right? This is putting that seed in your mind that I want to be separate from you that I want to be isolated from you. Do you think this is God's ideal? Of course not. God wanted Adam to draw closer. And as he's beckoning Adam closer, Adam's pushing him and the woman that God gave him further away. Doing exactly what Satan wanted him to do. And thus it's been ever since. Divisions between man and God, divisions between husband and wife, divisions between humans. Now, when we look at this commandment, some, some fun things happen. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The word adultery, it's a clear translation, but the question is, what did they mean with that word? I've gone through and I've looked at all the different commentaries. What specifically is God forbidding with this? And what a lot of the commentaries seem to agree on is that the issue here is different than the word fornication, and then even worse than that, the commentaries say that when we're talking about adultery, the concept that we should take is from Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the murderer, or the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So all the commentaries that I read, except for a couple, almost all of them, the agreement is adultery only can happen when you're dealing with a married or betrothed woman. That's what the commentaries teach was the custom of the ancient times. This is the law. The only one, the only time you get into trouble is if you are having an affair of some inappropriate nature with a married or betrothed woman. You got any problems with that? You got a little problem with that? We always, for example, seem to find ways to single out the woman when relationships happen. We always seem to find a way to single out the lady when bad things happen. And by the way, it doesn't say anything about the men. The man could be married, but as long as he's not sleeping with another married woman, he's fine. Is he really fine? <laughs> so I love it. I did find one commentator. It's this old rabbi guy. He says something along the lines of this. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Listen to how he interprets this. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So he just did a couple of big things here. First and foremost, do you have to have a physical act to have adultery? No. We'll talk more about that later. The second thing is, who gets busted for adultery in this interpretation? The man does. And of course, I don't want to take the letter of the law as legalistic. I, I think that there's room to say, as some commentators do, this interpretation says, I tell you that any woman who envisions a man longingly has already committed adultery with him in her heart. It's a modernization of it as well. Satan has always been trying to find ways to twist and distort and manipulate God's ideal. 
And so when we try to come up with funny little loophole interpretations that say that, oh, it's okay to do this as long as you don't do that, is that God's ideal? God wants a wholehearted commitment, not a relationship full of loopholes. So here we are. What does the Bible teach about these loopholes? What does the Bible show happens when people start to do all sorts of funny things to God's ideals for human interaction? Well, the story of David's lust for Bathsheba and ensuing actions resulted in, the multiple, in multiple deaths in their family and the division of the kingdom as a whole. It was the lust and the ensuing actions. And by the way, there's a four-letter word that starts with R that a lot of commentators very quickly pick up that David was doing when he used his power and influence to force himself into a relationship with Bathsheba. Is that God's ideal? No. He enters into a relationship with Bathsheba, takes her on as his eighth wife. Is that God's ideal? But a man after God's own heart did it. Doesn't that make polygamy okay? If you go through scripture, though there are no passages that clearly condemn polygamy, black and white, thou shalt not have multiple partners, there are zero positive examples of, of polygamy in scripture. Instead, we find multiple fights and failures in families who go beyond God's ideal of one husband and wife, or one boyfriend, one girlfriend. We find multiple instances of problems with that in scripture. We did a series last year about this time on the women of the Old Testament. Many of them were caught up into polygamous relationships and we saw the struggles and battles that they faced. It's not God's ideal. Here's an interesting one that we discover. Joseph resisted the advances of Potiphar's wife to have an affair. And yet the court still convicted him because of unfortunate evidence left in her possession at the scene. The story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, single man Joseph put into slavery in Potiphar's house in Egypt. Potiphar's wife develops a, a yearning to have Joseph, and he refuses. But in the process, was still close enough to her that she was able to grab hold of his coat and hold it as evidence, which sends him to prison. Sometimes we find ourselves in unfortunate circumstances. Though our intentions and our hearts may be pure, sometimes the circumstances set us up for failure. God uses the example of Hosea and the prostitute Gomer in order to teach the people how they had acted toward him. Prostitution is a common theme in the Bible. Is it ever positive? No. Now, of course, interestingly enough, who was one of the great, 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 grandsons of a prostitute? Jesus is. Yeah. A woman who disguised herself as a prostitute. Her name was Tamar. Jesus specifically says that Moses allowed divorce because of humanity's failures. And yet he clarifies in Matthew chapter 19 that this was not God's ideal either. It was only allowed because of the hardness of hearts. The scriptures also talk more about other distorted forms of relationships, such as incest, homosexuality, and bestiality. Yes, it is what you think it sounds like. Satan has even gone further than that in modern times. We seem to make it easier to allow relationships to break down. There are many modern tools that Satan is using to attack relationships, especially intimate relationships between male and female. Technology has allowed people to have secret, illicit relationships, perhaps, being, perhaps even while being in the presence of their spouse or others. Interesting fact that I discovered is that one out of five mobile phone searches are for adult materials. One out of five in eras past, it would be pretty obvious if you were doing something of an illicit nature. But now, 
You can do it in the privacy of your own screen, your own personal space. Technology allows other types of illicit relationships as well. In 2009, Facebook was mentioned in one in five divorce petitions. By 2011, it was one in three. Found one statistic that says divorce attorneys, 81% of divorce attorneys cite an increase in likelihood that they will find material by using Facebook or other social media as evidence, prime evidence, for their divorce proceedings. And in fact, divorce attorneys say that Facebook is evidence source number one in 66% of their cases today. Technology has made it easier to stay in touch, and that's a good thing, and that's a bad thing. Not all adultery happens in the flesh, or even necessarily while any other partners are around. Would you agree? 90% of men and women have been exposed to adult websites before their 18th birthday. 90% of men and 60% of women before their 18th birthday, with the average first exposure happening at 12 years old. I've heard people say that we need to wait until people are older to, to begin those science class discussions. We should wait until they're upper academy, high school aged people. I've actually heard one person suggest going as far as, well, they can't smoke until they're 18. Maybe we shouldn't start talking about it until then. If you wait until they're 18, you are six years too late. And dare I say, you're 10 years too late to start planting the seeds of what God's ideal is. One in eight web searches in general is for adult material, and you know what? It even happens in the church. 64% of Christian men and one in six Christian women regularly, once a month or more, view adult material. Is Satan hard at work? He sure is. He's doing everything he can to cause relationships to crumble and fail, and he is using the tools of adultery all over the place to do all sorts of amazing things. The one that most obviously stands out, and it's the one that I just quoted a bunch of statistics on, is the one that's, that's uh, adult material related. Listen to this one and why it makes it so dangerous. Susan Fisk, professor of psychology at Princeton University, used MRI scans to analyze brain activity of men viewing adult media. She found that after viewing it, men looked at women more as objects than as human beings. Is that God's ideal? Who were women created in the image of? Created in the image of God, that is God's ideal, that we would view them as children of God, created in His image. But we like to create objects, dehumanize, sever the relationship, sever the intimacy, and to isolate. That's what pornography... <laughs> One. <laughs> That's what adult material does. And by the way, it doesn't just have to be on a, an over-18 website to be adult material, does it? We have a certain sporting magazine that every year puts out a swimsuit edition. And this year, they are so excited. They're patting themselves on the back because for the first time ever, in order to deal with the body image issues, because are there body image issues that are coming up all over the place because of this widespread use of, of adult materials, and, and they're patting themselves on the back because for the first time ever, they have a plus-sized cover model. Size 14, size 16, somewhere in there. Can I ask the question? It's 2016. Why do we still have the magazine in the first place? They're not athletes. It has nothing to do with sports. What, what's the big deal? And here's what's really kind of crazy about those types of things. Gentlemen, when you view in 2016 any pictures of any person that has been put in professional print, 
What can you assume has been done to that person? Photoshop. They've been touched up. Back in the day, there were techniques where they could soften, they could minimize, they could eliminate. But now we can altogether distort, twist, and manipulate to create that thigh gap and present that as the ideal, for example. Here's the crazy thing in 2016. The professional supermodels are getting photoshopped to the point where many of them can't even recognize themselves in their own covers. If supermodels are not beautiful enough for today's world and without being photoshopped, what chance does anybody else have? Real people have wrinkles. Real people have bumps. <laughs> it's okay to be real. But what these adult materials say is no, it's not. We create whole generations of people that say that it's not okay. This is the ideal. This is what you should be striving for. These people who literally do not exist. That's the ideal. And we wonder why so many women have body image issues. We wonder why so many men are addicted to that. You think it has an impact on future relationships? Gentlemen and ladies, I stand before you as someone, in all honesty, who had the addiction for a very long time. I was first exposed at 11 years old. I wrestled with it for a very long time through middle school, high school, and even into college. It even impacted the early parts of my relationship with Andrea. There are major consequences on your relationship. Gentlemen, can I encourage you, if you haven't started yet, don't. You will never have the opportunity to take those images out of your mind that the devil will try to bring back into your mind. If you have started, with God's strength, and it takes a lot of God's strength, He can help you to overcome those addictions. There are tools, there are resources that are out there that can help you. Is it just the gentlemen who have a problem? No. As I mentioned, not only is adult material showing up in more and more in the possession of more and more women. But women have an alternate way of receiving adult material. Men are wired visually. It's a well-known fact. Men's eyes are what we, we use to, to really kind of gauge things. For women, what you really need to know is how it speaks to the heart. And so more and more women are starting to recognize that Hollywood isn't just targeting men with the messages that they portray through certain media types. Hollywood is using targeted messages to make women uncomfortable with their relationships as well. What do I mean? Listen to this quote. Uh, since the, is the word chimera, Thank you. Since the chimera of eternal, blissful, romantic love is perhaps the primary fable of our time, the fantasia of romantic comedies are encouraged. They are the equivalent of emotional, illicit material, the setting out of an unrealistic relationship between a man and a woman for the sake of manipulating the emotions and or desires of others. Simply put, gentlemen, does it make any sense to you whatsoever that she is so obsessed with the notebook? The movie? Those... those, those cheesy romance movies, does it make any sense to you whatsoever? No, you're not wired that way. But do you think they still raise billions of dollars, millions of dollars? All the time. What about those romance novels? You can find them at grocery stores. They must be harmless. 
But how many ladies have the secret yearning to have a guy like that come sweep her off of her feet? I want a guy like that. A guy who's perfect. He cried at Old Yeller. He always does the dishes. He always puts the seat down. Oh, if only. And then look at this slob over here. We set up all sorts of ways for ladies to equally stumble in today's world. We set up ways for all sorts of ways for ladies to equally wrestle with the person that God has put into their lives. And so we're at an interesting point in today's society where it's so easy and it's, it's almost the expectation to condemn the men because they're visually wired and to condemn the men because some of them wrestle with the visual stimulation that Hollywood has to offer. But then we say nothing about the emotional stimulation that Hollywood has to offer as well. And it's almost expected that when a good book comes out that really appeals that way, such as a great romance novel between a teenage girl and a sparkly vampire, <laughs> ladies go chasing after that by droves, and we even read about them in the church. When a novel comes out, about a relationship that is abusive and destructive and damaging and controlling and manipulative, such as Fifty Shades of Grey. And we think it's okay because Target will carry a line of materials related to Fifty Shades of Grey. We think it's okay to bring it into the church as well. What kind of damage does that do to God's ideal? of mutual committed relationships. Example for you. Anybody ever seen the movie Fireproof? If you haven't seen the movie Fireproof, amazing movie. Story Fireproof is it's called Fireproof because you have a gentleman, Kirk Cameron, who is a firefighter. He has a wife who works in a hospital. In this movie, what is the problem in this relationship? It's communication is one. But where is the source of the problem? Very early on, the, the source of the problem is always presented in terms of he ha the gentleman has an addiction to adult material. And we almost make him out to be the bad guy. That's the presentation. She's fine, she's fine, she's fine, he's the scum. Is she fine? As you start to pay attention to her story, you start to notice that she's developed feelings and interactions and intimacies towards another member of the hospital staff, a charming young doctor who brings her flowers and sits and has lunch with her and, and listens to her and makes her feel special. And she falls in love with this man, or so it would seem. What's really sad is by the time the, the husband realizes that something's wrong and, and he wants to turn his life around and he gives up his addiction, now he's going to fight for his wife because they're, they're going to get a divorce. And he actually at one point confronts the doctor because he realizes that they are, though they have never had any physical interaction, they're in a relationship, they're having an affair together. He goes and he confronts them. And, and kind of a, a funny scene is the doctor actually treated him for a hand injury at a fire. And so he goes up to the doctor and he says, hey, doc, I just want to thank you. My hand's feeling much better now. Right in his face. And then he leaves the room. And the doctor, nervously, reaches into his desk and pulls out his own wedding ring that he doesn't wear while he's, scoping, or while he's doing the rounds at work. Well, he's scoping out the women. Yeah. Satan has really turned things around, messed things up, hasn't he? He knows how to speak to our hearts in a way that we're not supposed to. Satan has used many different tools in an attempt to destroy God's ideal for relationships. And you know what? No matter how you look at these tools, 
rape, incest, homosexuality, illicit adult material, lust, any of these things. No matter how you look at any of these different tools that he's doing to destroy God's ideals, they all basically boil down to different versions of the same tools, which are domination, a pursuit of power, because that's what Satan has always wanted, and isolation. He wants humans to be off by themselves so that he gets a shot at them. They're all different versions of the same tools, domination and isolation, designed to destroy God's intent for a relationship. What is God's intent for a relationship? That the two would become one. Satan's ideal is that humans become alone, but don't forget what God's ideal is, that humans become one. I don't know if you're married. I don't know if you're not married. I don't know if you just have a good buddy. I don't know if you don't have any good friends, but you're here in this church today, you're watching along on the stream. God wants us to enter into mutually beneficial, uplifting relationships. That's the goal. And why does he want to have these relationships? Why is this such a big deal to God, that humans would have relationships with each other? He lets us know. Ephesians chapter 5, he gives us this great treatise on what marriage is supposed to be like. Wives are supposed to do this and husbands are supposed to do that. By the way, before he gets into that section in Ephesians chapter 5, before he talks about the role of the wives and the role of the husbands, he says that both of them should mutually submit to one another in the Spirit of God. Both of them are to mutually submit to one another. And at the end of the passage, he says this, this is a great mystery. I speak concerning the church and Christ, Christ and the church. That's what relationships are teaching us all about. How would Jesus treat his church? How would his church interact with, with Jesus? That's what this is all about, is getting a better concept of what eternity is like. I'll tell you what, I am so grateful to have a person in my life that pushes me to become more like Christ. And when I stumble, I'm thankful that she doesn't say, oh, that's okay, but she pushes me to do the better thing. But when she doesn't say, oh, that's okay, does she still show grace? I don't know about you. I'm grateful for a partner who shows grace. And I'm grateful that grace is unlimited from my partner because I'm thankful that our grace is unlimited from our God. So there's a whole lot more to say about relationships and interactions. This commandment is simple. Five words. Remember five words. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Four words if you're reading the Wicked Bible, remember? <laughs> five words. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But there's a lot to be said. And in fact, there's a lot more to be said about positive relationships. Uh, simply keeping this commandment, for example, won't guarantee a perfect relationship. If you simply don't commit adultery, it doesn't guarantee that you'll be happy with one another. But what this commandment is appealing to, what this commandment is calling you to, is a reminder that our God is a God of wholehearted mutual commitment. He wants wholehearted mutual commitment between husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, fiancés, and also wholehearted mutual commitment between friends and even communities. Because our God's a God of relationships, and He made us that way. We need sympathy, we need companionship. And we're in a world where we could really use some sympathy and companionship because there is a battle going on out there. Everywhere we turn, every time we turn on the TV, every time we turn on the radio, every time we turn on our phones, every time we turn on our computers, every time we turn on technology, and dare I say, we don't have to turn things on. And we still have to fight those battles, don't we? Because Satan wants to fight a battle with God and God's ideal. And so I just want to know, we need the armor of God to protect our bodies and our hearts as we fight this battle. How many of you want the armor of God? How many of you want God to shield your eyes as Job prayed for? I put it on the front of the bulletin. Jo Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not look lustfully upon young women. How many of you want to be like Joseph who's going to stand up for what's right, even when temptation calls? Ultimately, how many of you want to be like Jesus? Because that's the goal.
So rather than doing a closing song that we sing together today, I recognize that you all are going to take different scopes and different directions. You're all battling different things. Some husbands or some wives, some males and some females, you all have different struggles that you're going through. But this has impacted all of you, hasn't it? In some way, shape, or form, this battle impacts us all. And so rather than having a closing song for you to sing along with, I'm going to do a song here. I want you to listen along. You'll see the lyrics on the screen. I want you to reflect on this. The song is by a gentleman named Warren Barfield. He's a contemporary Christian artist, and the song is called Love is Not a Fight. The tagline of the song, you'll hear it over and over again, love is not a fight, but it's something worth fighting for. So I want you to listen to this. I want you to reflect on this. Because when you go from this place, you're going to have to go out into a battle. How many of you want to pray that God would step in and give you strength when you go from this place, in whatever particular battle you might be facing. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to reflect on this song, to reflect on God's ideal, and then we'll pray.